Okay, uh, this is my last session. I think I've done 10 sessions so far, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which I think is the most around here, and I have had a wonderful time. I really have, and I've had great audiences, and I can see, I can see there's going to be questions aplenty out here. And to answer them, we have the biggest panel I have so far worked with. And thank you very much for coming. My last panel, I had six speakers, of whom two turned up. Uh, but we still made it work. Here we've got a great collection of people. Please, please. Sir. Starting from the end, would you st I'm going to get each of the speakers to stand up and introduce themselves and tell us who they are and why they're here to talk about South Sudan. Starting at the end, please. Uh, my name is Jacob Duchol. I work for Nile Petroleum Corporation as the Director of Planning. And I'm excited to be here, uh, super excited, because this is my third year in uh, in Cape Town on the African week. And every year we come, we get new ideas, new thinking, new projects, new discourse. So, so I think the, the panel will be more excited to, to hear from you, the audience, on what exactly you want to ask, what is new for us this year, than what was not there last year, and what exactly do we do better to ensure that we make South Sudan a great country, and it makes also done a great nation for in investments, new investment, not all investment. And, and thank you very much. I will talk later about Nile Petroleum. Ah, thank you. it's a wonderful <laughs> introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, would you like to go next? But you say already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Potkan, the Minister of Petroleum, Republic of South Sudan. Thank you. Ian. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ian Cloak. I am the COO for a company called Aventra. Uh, which was set up this year. It stands for Africa Energy Transition. Uh, and before I, I uh, set up the company with uh, a couple of my colleagues, I, I worked for a company called Tullo Oil uh, for 15 years. Uh, I'm a geologist by background. Um, I actually was called a witch doctor uh, by His Excellency Gabriel Lehman in the last session. Um, I was exploration manager for Uganda and Kenya through uh, 2007 uh, through to 10. Did the sale to CNOT Total uh, and then did uh, we, we did repeated the feat in, in Kenya. And so my, my history with South Sudan uh, is actually since 2009, uh, Tullo was looking at it and we, we became, became very close over the years to, to entering South Sudan until I left in 2020. Excellent. Um, Kotato. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Kotato Mulaba. I'm the executive representing uh, the Strategic Fuel Fund in South Sudan. We are exploring an oil block, Block B2, in South Sudan, and we are also doing some studies towards a, a refinery and a pipeline. So we are doing some exciting things in South Sudan. Excellent. And our, from Malawi, very special. Sorry. Okay, I, I actually, well, I'm a Malayan, but I'm, coming, I'm from South Sudan. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Trinity Energy Limited, a local South Sudanese company owned by indigents of South Sudan, which has been uh, attributed uh, for basically eradicating the black market for fuel which was there and resolving shortages that used to be, uh, beset the economy. Uh, so from 2018 up to now, Trinity Energy has been in the forefront in terms of ensuring that the country has got uh, liquid fuels to power the, uh, the economy. We're, we're expanding into the uh, upstream. We're also expanding into power. And uh, of course, as we go forward, the refinery is on the drawing board. Uh, we will be looking for partners uh, to, to join hands and then we, we move the, uh, forward. Thank you. Robert, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, is, was there anybody here who wanted to actually stand up and formally <coughs> give a presentation, or are you happy to, we run through some questions, and everybody gets the idea, and then we take questions from the audience. Is that okay? Yeah, so questions. Wonderful, wonderful. So the first question is, we know that there is a shortage of investment capital in oil, coal, gas, uh, which doesn't really help Africa, but we know that is a reality. Dealing with this shrinking money market, and with so many hands, so many very good investment centers reaching out, trying to get a share of what capital there is. How does South Sudan make sure that it has a case in the international market? What are its selling points that it can say invest here rather than somewhere else? 
Sir, starting from you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, in the couple of uh, two days, we have been discussing about the transition, transition to energy or energy transition. And what has come to my mind is that uh, where are we transition? Transition from what? Or from where to where? Or from what to where? And what's important is that if we talk about energy transition, we must be very careful about how do we transit? Is it from fossil fuel? Is it from coal? Is it we transit to crude? We transit to, to gas? And exactly how do we do all this? In the context of NALPED, we, we are basically very, uh, very grounded on our uh, three value chain level, on the downstream, the midstream, and the upstream. However, we have not really gone to the exploration, but of course, we are working toward <coughs> that to ensure that we, we explore by 2027 in, in, in our plan. But what's important to take note of is that in South Sudan today, we, we have looked at and how best do we promote our finances in terms of uh, making sure that we, we make more resources from the downstream, from the sale and distribution, make more money there, so that these money are invested in the midstream and upstream, particularly in the, in the petrochemicals. And we speak today, and, and we discussed this last year, and I said uh, the Nile Petroleum was working on a refinery. At the moment, we have a small refinery of 10,000 of 10, barrels. Of course, we're producing 3,000 barrels per day. Uh, we have that ready at the moment in South Sudan. So uh, what has been a challenge is uh, the, the market, because where the refinery is, has been surrounded by waters. It's like flooded area uh, in Bentiu. So, so we have been looking at Sudan. We, we are not talking about <coughs> transporting to Sudan to Khartoum, but then the, the, the river has a lot of, of, a lot of uh, dust, or you call it a lot of sand dust. So you need to dredge it first. So we're working now on the, on the drainage of the river to, to dredge it first so that uh, the, 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 the batch and, and the chiefs move to Khartoum. So, so that's a big achievement uh, that uh, we, we can talk about at the moment as one of the projects. And the finances were very, very, very difficult. And, and we, we don't want that part to be taken again by any projects in, in Africa. Uh, of course, uh, we had uh, the Russians coming in with 70%, and then we had 30% at the national oil company. Uh, but of course, it took a while to have a financing bank to help this refinery kickstart. So, so money came directly from these two companies, Nile Petroleum and Safinats. And, and, and that is a challenge we are facing today about how do we finance, how do the, the financing of the projects, how, how, how do I how do untap all these opportunities. Opportunities are available in South Sudan, but by the challenge of getting really bank, bank, bankers or banks that will deliver or give loans or, 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 or finance this project so that the, the investment is unlocked. So this is a key challenge, but of course, it's a challenge that we all know what to do about it. And we believe that if, if you want to invest, you have to begin from your point of view, if you are an NOC like, like ourselves, before you go to the bank and get those loans. Because those loans are also having a lot of interest attached to them. So in our case, in terms of finances, it's, it's, it's a big challenge, it's a big elephant in the room. But we believe that, uh, of course, uh, it's an area where we need to partner together to ensure that uh, we move forward to untap the opportunities that are there in South Sudan and opportunities that are there within NALPET, at the Nile Petroleum Corporation in the country. Thank you. Honorable Minister, we, you're in a room with representatives from all the other 250, 260 countries around the world, starting with Afghanistan, ending in Zimbabwe. Why should they settle their capital, their money, on South Sudan? Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity. And uh, thank also to Energy Capital for organizing this and putting South Sudan on the spotlight. Uh, to me, there is nothing more than that. It's a, it's, it's a very good step forward, and, uh, and we really appreciate that. Now, I think first let us look at energy itself before we ask anybody to come to the Republic of South Sudan. Uh, oil today constitutes 98% of our budget. So literally, our budget, our economy, depend on oil. Now, when you talk about energy, you are basically talking about energy serve as a foundation for peace in our country. It also serve as a catalyst for our economic growth in the country. And it is the only tool that you also use 
for the economic recovery in the Republic of South Sudan, be it from pandemic or from the conflict itself. This is number one that we need to understand. The second thing that we need to understand is, and I address myself to it uh, during the opening, is about the transition. I also want to make myself clear here that nobody is against the transition, but it must be just, fair, and inclusive. We must all have the opportunity to sit down and discuss. Remember, I said earlier, energy, when it comes to the Republic of South Sudan, is a foundation for peace, meaning anything that disrupted in the middle without having a substitute to that is a recipe for a crisis. And hungry man is angry man. Now, why would we tell people come to the Republic of South Sudan? You know, everything in the Republic of South Sudan remains virgin in terms of development. And I believe the best destination for any investor in the whole world is the Republic of South Sudan. Because we are young in everything. Why do I say that? First of all, we are the youngest nation. Somebody would say, well, why would you be young? You are part of the bigger Sudan. But somebody who know the history of the Sudan, the conflict that was in the Sudan, you will make a conclusion without anybody advising you that given the conflict, the longest civil war in the Sudan, by then, it means there was no developmental projects that were going on in the Republic of South Sudan. And if that was not happening, it means everything is virgin. Not only in the petroleum sector, but in every sector that you want to work in. Now, one would say, and these are things that I hear often, somebody will say, well, the governance is an issue in the Republic of South Sudan. Somebody will again say, well, there is no ethic, you know, uh, there is too much corruption. And another one will talk about insecurity. Now, what we are telling you here, you have a choice to make. You can come privately and do your business in the Republic of South Sudan. You can also come and do business with the government. And in terms of governance, it has nothing to do with your business. Provided that the laws, the policies, the regulations that are in place are able to protect you as an investor and that local partner that you have. That is number one. Ethic. I believe at some point, some of the things were exaggerated in one way or the other. And it would be important for an individual to walk to the Republic of South Sudan, do something so that you also get it first hand yourself. But I still have a belief there was some exaggeration and that our people, the young people, the people who are outside there doing businesses, majority of them are young people who have gone in other parts of the world. I have seen a lot of countries when they got their independence, some of them did not even have an individual C, uh, PAD older. But today, you have a lot of educated young South Sudanese in other parts of the world who have moved into the country and they are trying to do their businesses. So things are changing. The last on this is security. We have signed an agreement in 2018. And as a result of that, personally we are sitting here, I became a minister. And because of that agreement, we believe that things are moving. And the agreement itself has given us an opportunity to reform our country. And one of the chapters in that agreement is called, is chapter four of the agreement, is economic reform. From how things are run from the Ministry of Finance, how things are run in the oil sector, to any other sector in the country. So I'm inviting all of you to look at that agreement as well, so that 
you, you ask yourself, if you have gone five years ago, are things the same today? Of course, no. Things are not the same. Five years ago, some of the oil fields were not working. Today, they are all back to operation. They are working. I don't want to take much of your time, but I wanted to say, we also form a committee that is called Public Financial Management Committee. The Minister of Finance is the chairperson and co-chaired by developmental partners. Currently, it is co-chaired by the Norwegian ambassador. And I'm the deputy of that committee. What are we looking at? We are looking at all the economic reforms that are put in the agreement so that they are reflected on the ground. Not only in the ministries where we, that we had, but in every ministry. If there is something that the agreement says should be done in that particular ministry, we go and tell you, do this. Because it's good for our nation, it's good for our people. I would end by saying, South Sudan is the best de destination to go. Yesterday I made a statement. You know, one comedian said, it's not a committee, it's, uh, it's an old man who has moved around and he has seen so many countries. And he came back and said, in South Sudan, you can grow anything, including metal. If you grow metal today, it will grow in the Republic of South Sudan. What does that mean to you? It means the land is fertile. Metal may not grow, but it gives you the opportunity to grow anything that you wanted to, and it will. And this brings me to my conclusion by saying, we believe, and this is my take, because I believe in the generation, the younger generation that is coming up in the Republic of South Sudan, they have what it takes. I believe we will be the brace basket, not only in East Africa, but in the whole of Africa. Thank you so much. <coughs> Just before I come to Ian, can I tell you that after 40 years as a, as a journalist, watching ministers dodge subjects, I'm so impressed that you tackled head-on insecurity, corruption, conflict, always best to get the difficult ones out. I commend you for that. It was a very Thank courageous you. thing to do, and it's what the audience wanted to hear. Ian. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I think uh, I'd agree with a number of things the Honourable uh, Minister said. Uh, what I was going to probably talk about is a little bit of the, the race for capital as we see it, um, and, and our experience of, of raising capital with, um, over the last sort of six months, uh, and maybe a bit before that. Um, if, you, if you step back, just the, the, the potential, though, of South Sudan from a geology perspective, so as a geologist, uh, exploration, development, or production, it, it's probably uh, one of the few in Africa remaining huge potential, with, hu with huge potential, um, both, both the rifts there and from a production development opportunity uh, with the existing oil fields can actually go on for many years. So th th that side, sort of the, the, the geology, <coughs> the rock side, it, is excellent. I think where, when we, when we look at, from, from a young company looking at the race for capital, that the capital for oil and gas, it, it has shrunk massively since, probably started in about 15, um, but particularly over the last couple of years. And, and we have to go out and raise uh, debt um, reserve-based lending if we're, if we're going into production development. Uh, and a number of the banks, the, the bank pool that was there, isn't, isn't there any longer. So it, it's a smaller pool of capital, and therefore in Africa or, or, or South America, every country is, is competing for, for a smaller pool. So then we, the way we assess the, this is, is that countries have to give fair fiscals, um, because that you're in a competition with other countries. Transparency, top quartile, enabling environment. So any um, exploration or, or development production has to be brought on quick, execution at pace, which gives value back to, to the country, but also to the investor to get the returns. It, it can't, it's not good enough any longer to, to have 10 years of waiting for a project to come on stream. The rocks have to be good, and that's a tick, obviously, in Sudan. And um, I think that the, the challenge, as we see it, when we look forward, is for us to invest. The, the other thing, and having taken 
South Sudan to my old company's board a couple of times, the, the difficulty for, for us back then, and it's still there, is, is the, and we talked yesterday, is the, the US sanctions. From a Western company perspective, uh, that means that we, from a, and listed on the UK stock exchange, we, we're unable to invest. We can't get the, the technology to deploy. And I think if that can be removed, th there will be a flood of uh, investment uh, to come in. Khotato, <coughs> do you have something to add? Yeah, why, why South Sudan? So, um, so firstly, this strategic fuel fund is uh, a state-owned company. It's owned by the South African government. Um, and, and South Africa has been invested in South Sudan since South Sudan was still in its mother's womb. Um, and and, and for, from where we are coming from, we, we see ourselves as African first. Uh, what, what we say is, if, if we are going to talk about a peaceful South Sudan, it's a difficult conversation to have if there's no investment in South Sudan. And who must invest in South Sudan if, if Africans are not investing there? Uh, I think we, we have taken a position as, as, as South Africa to say, we are also an energy scarce country. So, so the conversation we are having as, as, as oil producing African countries and, and high consuming, oil consuming African countries, we're saying, why don't we satisfy the African demand among Africans first before we go outside? Why, if we are to take equity in any oil block, why should it not be an African block first before any, anywhere else? If we are to import any oil, any crude oil into South Africa, should we not be in importing more from the African countries first before we are importing from anywhere else? So, so, so South Sudan becomes then a, a natural option for us because, uh, as the minister said, really it's, it's a virgin country. Uh, it's a place where investment is, is easy to make because we are part of building the, the future and the tomorrow of South Sudan. So, so from a South African point of view, and from a strategic fuel, point of, fuel fund point of view, we say, if, 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 if South Africa can offer, for example, at SFF, the, the, the largest storage facility in the Southern Hemisphere, and we're offering that to our African oil producers, uh, we should be able to also make investment in the barrels that are coming out of the blocks of South Sudan, out of the blocks of our fellow African oil producers as well. So, so that's the strategy that we are. We are, we are taking, and that's our relationship that we have with, uh, with uh, South Sudan. It's a very interesting point. Should South Africa be buying African oil? I would have thought, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way, but absolutely. Um, I, I did say that Robert from Malawi, uh, I only said that because uh, my father is buried in Malawi. He is working in South Sudan and very engaged in South Sudan. Sir, would you like to give some thought to this. Why? Why would capital go to South Sudan as opposed to Australia or Indonesia or Vietnam or somewhere else? Yeah, so first and foremost, we need to say that we believe in South Sudan as a South Sudanese company. And we believe that there are opportunities to be uh, uh, grabbed and uh, used to the benefit of the people of South Sudan. So earlier on in my introduction, my self-introduction, I did mention that print energy, which is uh, an indigenous company owned by the indigenous of South Sudan who saw, an, saw a problem like in the first instance it was the, the issue of shortages of petrol, of diesel on the market and they went out and looked for a solution using the, uh, the African bank and obviously with the support of government. So we believe in South Sudan and we believe that we have uh, what it takes to, uh, to attract investment because we, being a private sector entity Obviously, each project has to be looked at uh, uh, holistically, first and foremost, as, an, as, a, as a local company that is uh, expanding into the region as an integrated energy solutions provider. Each project must make sense in terms of positive returns. And once we have determined that this project is making positive returns, we will then go ahead and market that to our partners. So for example, at the moment, we are looking at the big projects. Uh, we're looking at the refinery. Uh, the refinery, the, the oil is in the, in the ground, it's being pumped, it's being exported into, south, into Port of Sudan, out into the Middle East, and then come back through Mombasa, back to us. Does it make sense? No. So 
we are going to a scalable project like the 40,000 40, barrels a day project, <coughs> knowing very well that we have a captive market within South Sudan, but within the region. Ethiopia is a case in point. The amount of barrels that they're consuming on a, day, on a daily basis is more than this 40,000 barrels refinery will, will do in the first place, but it's a scalable refinery. We, the, the, the country, when you switch on the global map, the Google Earth map, in the night, when the night covers Africa, light will be seen in Cape Town, light will be seen in Cairo, light will be seen probably in Lagos. But in the middle here, probably you see dots here and there, uh, maybe flare, somebody's doing gas flaring, but South Sudan will probably be in the dark. So there is a market for power. And because of the, the nature of the country, the sparse population, we're talking about Minister, Honourable Minister yesterday talked about about 15 million people. We are saying, come on, guys, come with us. Come with us to WOW, which is uh, one of the third, third centers of the country. Come with us to Malacca. We do mini grids. And these mini grids make sense because there's demand. And in those areas, there are minerals that need to be expo uh, explored, but power is missing. Uh, in Juba itself, we have light. I think we have had light in the last two, one and a half years. There was no light. Everybody was generating their own electricity from, uh, in the backyard. Opportunities are there. So, what we are saying is a private sector company that believes in South Sudan, attracting capital will be on a case-by-case -case basis. And it makes sense. Talk about sanctions. Being a private sector company, we are focused. We do due diligence on anything, all, all the facets of a project. And one legal due diligence that we did was to look at the, the sanctions. What do these sanctions mean to us as a private sector company? And so we dug, uh, using our international <coughs> law firms, and we found out it is about transfer of technology. And there are processes that a company that is invested can follow to get exemptions from the, uh, the commerce department. So these things, you know, on paper, South Sudan looks bad. On the ground, come. Come and see what it looks like on the ground. Yes, don't be intimidated by the height of the people. In fact, they are, <laughs> they are the warmest people that are found in Africa. Um, you know, just... When I was flying in, uh, sorry, my, uh, my mate from Malawi, when I was flying in for the first time, and I, I, I got uh, a ticket, so I sat, and a lady came. I thought, oh, she's going to pass by. She says, oh, excuse me, sir, can I sit here? So I said, yeah, yeah, sure. I was on the aisle seat, she was on the window seat. Then uh, as I was settling in, she said, excuse me, sir, I might need a bit of space on your side. So she, because she was so tall, she had to take my space. But uh, there we were. When I got out, everybody was impressed. Where are you from? Malawi. Oh, Malawi. Malawi. They were the warmest people. Come and invest. Come and enjoy this warmth with them. And eat the fish from the Nile. Freshwater Nile fish. So as a private sector company, each project must make sense for us first and foremost. Then it will make sense to the bankers. Then it will make sense to our partners. So for us, we will be able to attract capital. We have done that in the, in the past. And we, we are confident that we will do it again and again. Thank you. Minister, did you hear this, talking about the tall people of South Sudan? Are we going to throw him out now or later? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I, I, I've only got one more question, and again, we'll go around right from the beginning there, and then we'll go open to the audience. And that is, you've, all of you have tackled bold topics. Ian did, you know, we, everybody did tackle these bold topics, the minister did, um, of uh, thing, perceptions of South Sudan. But what are truly the things, perhaps, that South Sudan could and should do differently. I know that when you go on it's either the World Bank or the IMF, I think it's the World Bank, you go on the website, and they've got this interactive map of all the countries of the world, and it tells you how many days it takes on average to set up a company. And you touch Singapore, and it's one day, and you touch Taiwan, and it's one day, and you touch South Africa, and I think it's 62 days or something. <laughs> and you go on, to, no, seriously, and you go on and, and you look at the countries that are doing incredibly well. Believe me, those are the countries like Botswana where you can get on the plane, go to the post office, and by the end of the day, you have your company registration, provided you've done your, obviously, you, you, you've done your searches and made sure that you're not encroaching on somebody else's name. What are the things that South Sudan could do differently, both from our South Sudanese guests, but also the people from outside who are reaching in and doing business there? We're going to start at the end again, please. If you could give us your ideas on what South Sudan needs to improve, and will perhaps in the next year improve, um, as a lure to the people in this room to come there and, as you say, do business and invest. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, 
first and foremost, I, I do not want to, to talk politics because my minister is here. I just want to be as technical as possible. So, um, well, first and foremost, as national own company, we, we have done enough and we are doing a lot. And uh, we are looking forward to, to change in embracing new investors to us. Because if you want to invest in South Sudan, we are commercial wing of the government. So you come to ministry, they will tell you that, yes, you sign an F5, you want to explore a block, and then you are, you are sent to us so that we represent the government interest in that uh, consortium. <coughs> so while working with us, we are very cognizant on a lot of issues which are important to you as investors. We are very open for an idea that you want to give us in terms of for us to do better. Ideas of governance, ideas of uh, you know, making sure that we do well, compliance. Our bank also are very strict in South Sudan. We, we, we bank with Stanbic, and we have a very strict compliance on Stanbic, so we also follow the same rules. And therefore, we are also very cognizant of rule of law and how we do our business in South Sudan. Uh, as a new state, we have a lot of challenges, like other states that are new in Africa. And these challenges are not actually, they cannot be summoned within a day or week or month. Nile Petroleum is barely 11 years old. We were incorporated in 2009, before we got independent as a company under civil authority of New Sudan. And then by 2011, we basically became a company of South Sudan, a public share, a public shareholding company by the government. So the share we manage are government shares. However, we also do business in our joint ventures. We have, we have right now 10 joint ventures that where you can come in at a private company to invest with Nalpet. We have, uh, across the value chain, we have joint venture on roads. Uh, a yard company from Sudan is now doing business with us. They are doing road constructions, and they are doing also a lot of work in the oil field. They are doing good business. The turnover from Sudan is very good now at the moment. We have uh, a company from Italy giving us technology. We are also in the same business. We have a company from Poland working with us on the <coughs> data and data systems. We are doing business with them. We have a company from China working with Saipet and working with us as Nile Petroleum Corporation. We take almost 100% shares. They are also doing good business here from China. We have uh, a company from uh, 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 Nigeria right now working on the gas modernization. Before, we used to flare gas. Our law says that you, you should not flare gas in the field, but the law again gives you an option of flaring because if you, don't, if you don't have anything to do with the gas, you can flare it up in the field. So when we got uh, Nile Delta, when they came to us from Nigeria, we agree with them, and, 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 and they are now using uh, a technology now to, 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 to modernize gas, absorb the gas so that the gas is changed to liquid, to become part of the liquid purified gas. So, so all these investments are coming to us. We also have an, an, an investment from South Africa. We have just, uh, you have just heard from Kotaso now. We also have Oranto on board also uh, from Nigeria. They are also on Block B3 and, 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 and SFF on Block B2. You know, and we are expanding. We're expanding. So, so if, if you are late as an investor, then of course you will not, uh, you'll eat bones when you come later after uh, two years or three years or four years. So, so it's a good time for you to come in and, and be able to walk the journey with us together. Because this journey is a journey that we have to work. We don't know how long it will take for us to be able, you know, uh, to be sufficient in energy. None of us in this world can say that I'm, I'm, I'm sufficient as far as energy concerned. It's a journey that you work for many years to be, to be self-sufficient. So, so we believe that as an Al Patron Corporation that we, we, can, we can do business with you and, and we, can, we can give you your best, uh, on the best practice. We can do business on the best practice so that you feel happy an investor when you do JV with us. You feel happy an investor when you do a block, when you are exploring oil and gas. We'll be with you together because we are carrying on a state-owned company. So that's very important. The other important thing also that I want to share with you is that we want to operate a block as well. As I said, by 2027, we have a vision of owning a block. And that's also important for you if you want to, to come to us and also help us in other services that are required in terms of uh, maybe seismic and exploration, magnetic and so on and so forth. You can also come with us and we can journey to the same journey together with you. So and therefore these opportunities are there in South Sudan. As, as my colleague have said, uh, South Sudan is, is, is a country actually. If you have never come in, you know, you will not believe this is a country that there. I remember when I was going to Dubai, I, I went for the first time and, and, and I sat in the plane and her hostess came and asked me, which country is this? I said, South Sudan. This South Sudan? Mm. I said, yes. He said, if you take this country between UAE and, and, and Saudi Arabia and uh, Bahrain, 
this country will not be there for uh, you know, a month. It will just be taken over by everybody. I said, why do you say this? So this is the most fertile country. It's just, I just flown up and I saw the, the greeniness of South Sudan. And I could not believe this. And I said, what about Dubai? You say UAE, you will go and see what happened in UAE. So when I flown over UAE and I saw the whole desert and so on and so forth. But of course, they use the technology to survive. That's why in UAE, the cattle stay in ACs. Okay? Yeah, they, they grow crops in the ACs. In South Sudan, we don't use ACs for our cows and goats and whatever. They just use the, the natural rains and, and forests and so on and so forth. So South Sudan is a destiny for you, for those who are here today. And Nile Petroleum Corporation, as a national oil company, is there to journey with you. We are open for, for anything, for improvement. We are open, we can advise you to do your best investment in South Sudan. If you don't want to invest with Nile Petroleum Corporation, you have a sisterly investor like Trinity here, you know, we'll be happy. You know, we, we like Trinity, we, we love them because they are doing a good job. And that's a private se sector driven. A country should be driven by a private sector, it should not be owned by governments. We government, we just facilitate, but then you take over opportunities. <coughs> so when Trinity came in to come with that, we did not compete with Trinity, we told Trinity, <coughs> go ahead, go ahead, do better and do well. And we are just there. So I want to say that South Sudan is ready for you, and Nile Petroleum Corporation is very much ready today in all the 10 JVs and more JVs that you want to give us when you come and, and fly to South Sudan, you will able now to see which areas you want to invest in. Because we can't tell you now, unless you come to the country, you will check <coughs> yourself, you go to the oil field, you will even see an opportunity there and say, I want to invest in you know, the waste management, for example, around the refineries, or waste management in the field. And then from there, it's easy. We just come and sit with you, we sign a JV, you got your shares, we get our shares, and then we do business. You know? So I want, to, I want to conclude by saying that, welcome to South Sudan, and come and see by your eyes. Thank you very much. Uh, before, please, yes, a very good answer, an extensive answer. Before I come to our guest of honor, I, I learned something just when I was talking to the minister early on that I should have known but didn't know, and that is that parliament in South Sudan is in English, and Hansard and parliamentary records are in English. And that sounds like a small thing, but actually if you're doing due diligence or looking at the viability of the laws of the country, it makes an enormous difference. I think it's worth recording. Um, Minister, I know this is a difficult question for anybody in politics, because if I say to you, what are the things that South Sudan could improve, of course, <laughs> your electorate's going to say, well, probably, why haven't you done it? This is always the challenge in politics. But could I ask you, you were very forthright earlier on, uh, and, and uh, the audience responded to it and enjoyed it. Um, are there a couple of things, one or two things, that you would like to see done better in South Sudan that you would hope in the next year or two would be in order to attract that all-important investment? Uh, <clears throat> again, thank you so much for uh, indeed giving us the opportunity. And, and I'm requesting here that those who are not South Sudanese in this room should help us spread the message. And when they come to South Sudan, I believe some of the things that we are saying here, you go and ask a re randomly any South Sudanese, they will be able to address themselves to. Now, the question is, what is it that we should improve? I remember I did talk about the agreement earlier. And there is a particular chapter in the agreement that talk about reform. Meaning, it's no longer a question that should be answered by politicians, but is a recognition from the people of South Sudan that something has gone wrong somewhere and that we must fix it. And that's why we talk of economic reforms. When you are talking of reform, it means there might be something that exists, but it did not go well. You want to make it better. And therefore, we are hoping as a country to sit on the table with anybody and tell us what they think is not done rightly. We will be in a position to change that. Today, let me take you through a process. There are laws that the agreement said must be looked at, must be reviewed. And as per the agreement, the agreement formed a committee called National Constitution Amendment Committee. They amended the constitution, and there are a number of laws from security sector laws all the way to economic sector laws. 
They are being reviewed. They will be taken back to the parliament, and the parliament will pass those into act. Therefore, it means we have recognized as a nation that there are a few things here and there that need to be fixed. But that's not enough. If anybody has the feeling that something is not correct, come and sit with us. Because we may have not noticed that, but you have seen it, and you wanted that change. As long as it will benefit the people of South Sudan and our country in general, we have no issue changing that. Now, you talk about our parliament is speaking in English. Yes, in the constitution, the official working language is English. But we are a common law country, for your information. We are a common law country, and all our laws are common law countries, uh, laws. We are not a civil law country. We are not a Sharia law. We are a common law. Meaning, a law that you find in the Republic of South Africa may exactly look the same, or there may be slight changes depending on our circumstances. Because what we consider first is who are we? If you ask that question, we are South Sudanese. What is it that we have? Because what we have may not necessarily mean it's the same as what you have in Zimbabwe. It might be different. And we must define ourselves in every law that we make. But what is the source of our law? Other acts that we do is the constitution, the custom that we have. So that means we are open. The third that I wanted to say, two very important law. The Investment Act. We have the act that defines clearly what needs to be done if you come to the country. So if you are an investor, it's just a matter of you saying, I want to read your investment act. You will be told how to find it. You go through it, you will see where you are protected and where you are not protected. But I believe we have one of the best law. You also go, the other act that is very important is the Companies Act in the Republic of South Sudan. We have one of the best Companies Act. But I also want to inform something, I want also to inform you that in that act, it said that if you come into the country, if you are to have a local partner, the local partner or a national partner must have more than 31%. But there are incentives attached to that. If you want to qualify to be a national company in the Republic of South Sudan, there are incentives attached to it that other could not get, others should not get. Today, Trinity Energy, why do they excel? They excel because they are a national company. They are a local company. And there are benefits that they get more than any other person. But if you ask me today, the statistic that I have in front of me, the downstream supply of fuel is dominated by foreigners from Somalia, Kenya, and other countries, and Sudan. Okay? But why did Trinity Energy excel? Because it's a local company. And therefore, there are incentives attached to a local company. When they come to our offices, we say, okay, this is what the law say. This is how we will assist you, because you are a local company. And when we tell people, you come to South Sudan, you look for a local company, it's for two reasons. One is for you to be protected in terms of incentive. Number two is because we wanted you to transfer skills and knowledge. We want the South Sudanese young women and young men to have the opportunity, work with you, learn from you, so that tomorrow, <coughs> if you say, well, the, in the investment here is not worth it, I want you to leave, you will leave us with somebody who have what it takes to take our country forward. Last but not the least, South Sudan, you talk about um, registration of companies earlier, and that's why I did uh, uh, address myself 
to corruption that people talk about across earlier. Now, when you come to South Sudan, for you to register a company, you don't need to come to any of us. All you need is somebody to give you a direction to a law firm. You go to the law firm. The law firm will tell you what are the requirements for you to register a company. If you fulfill all those, the lawyer will do memorandum of association. They will take it to the Ministry of Justice. Depending on the number of companies that are applying that day, if it happened that you are the only one, or you are two, you are three, you go 10 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you have your certificate. Not only that, there are a number of certificates that the law say you must obtain. You don't even need to appear there. Your lawyer will go to all the offices and collect your certificates and say, sir, here are your certificates. So the registration is not such a difficult process. Now, people talk about the US sanction, and I'm glad that uh, my brother did mention it here. I talk about it from first day till today. And I'm going to repeat the same words for those of you who have been there in all the sessions where I spoke about US sanctions. Please expect the same. It's not because I want to repeat myself, but it's simply because I want you to look at the situation critically. You are from Zimbabwe. Some people fought sanction Zimbabwe. And if you ask somebody, somebody will tell you because of Robert Mugabe. He made policies, and therefore we must sanction Zimbabwe. Where is Mugabe today? Dead. It's not there. If I, as a minister, and I always give example of myself, I happen to be a minister today. There are so many young South Sudanese outside there who have what it takes better than I do, who are supposed to be ministers. If I committed a mistake, it does not mean the whole of South Sudan have committed a mistake. It means this particular minister have committed that mistake. And the next generation should not pay the price on my behalf. Because you will not be doing justice to that generation. You will not be doing justice to them. Therefore, you need to deal with us knowing that tomorrow is more important, is more brighter than today. And I always give example. US, for us to arrive to CPA, Comprehensive Peace Agreement, in the bigger Sudan, US contributed a lot. We cannot take it away. Our refugees, I was a refugee myself. You will get a book, will be cut into two. You get part of it, and I have part of it. It's written USA at the back. You will get, you know, oil put in a jerkin. It's written USA. A sack of maize, USA. They have spent billion plus dollars for 21 years for some of us to be who we are today. They have supported us during the CPA. Today, when the conflict happened in the country, you have refugees, U.S. is still contributing to them. You have IDPs, they are contributing to them. We are not saying that they have not contributed for us to be an independent state. They did. But now, look at this situation. And this is what I always say. You have refugees. You go and give them food. You go and give them medicine. Why don't you give this money, or you come with your company, invest in the country, produce food, so that these South Sudanese will be able to have that food home, not in a refugee camp. And I always say, if I go to your hospital, and you send me to the lab, and the result came out that I have malaria, and instead of you to give me malaria tablets or injection, you end up giving me a Panadol. What are you treating? You are treating the symptom, but you leave the disease. What I'm saying, South Sudan, and this is what I've been saying by our president, we are ready to sit down and dialogue with the Americans. If it can prevent any other person to come to the Republic of South Sudan, we are ready to sit down with them. And let's sit down 
and see how do we cure malaria instead of curing symptoms. Thank you so much. A powerful point of view and a challenge from the top. The minister has told us that uh, South Sudan is not plagued by endless queues for pointless pieces of paper. That is refreshing to anybody who does business in Africa and Asia. And the challenge from the minister, I think I'm right, that if you find something that doesn't work for business and that you think could be improved, the minister's asked you to bring it to his attention. Am I right? You have eyes. So there you've had it from the top. You can't get better than that. Ian, we, we're going to need to go to the audience, but would you like to give us a few I'll comments on this? What, you've been there. You've been on the ground level. What could yeah. South Sudan do better? No, I'll, I'll be really quick on it. Um, I think perception, actually, when, when we, when, in my former company, looking at across Africa, perception we actually used as almost an opportunity because we felt that any country, as long as it passed through the, the, the right gates, we could operate in. And if I look through, we, we were in Uganda from... Uh, the late 90s. We had to manage on the ground in Lake Albert uh, with the Lord's Revolutionary Army uh, shooting up vehicles there. We managed through we, and we, we found the oil there. In Kenya, um, in, in Lake Turkana uh, and e in Ethiopia and South Omo, we probably have one of the most heavily armed areas, particularly in Omo, South Omo, where uh, almost everybody had an AK-47. We still managed to acquire size. We can drill wells. So when we talk perception, we see actually as, as an opportunity if others uh, stay away. Uh, what does stop us, though, and, and it's, it, it's really good to listen to His Excellency just talking about the, the, when it's a sanction, is let's say we, we were producing oil in Cote d'Ivoire when they had the Civil War. We were within days of shutting down because there were going to be sanctions on, on the country. And that, that's the biggest thing if... if uh, that, that stops. I mean, when we look at investments in producing, uh, producing assets, in, in Ghana, we, we've invested, Tullo invested about 11 to 12 billion. That's the scale that if you've got sanctions on, the from a Western company can't do. The opportunity, one other one, which is completely, is off oil. And I said yesterday, the environment. I mean, if you fly across South Sudan or Sudan and you could go across the Sud, um, I mean, the, the, the Sud is just incredible and you've got the migration there uh, it's the Okavango as I would call it on steroids and an ecotourism destination I think in the uh, in the future which is one that is barely known outside really parts of Africa so excellent excellent have you got something mm. to add yeah to um, this? yeah my mind will be quick uh, three things really um, for fortunately, South Sudan is traveling a journey that South Africa has traversed over the past 27 years. Um, th there's a temptation, Minister, uh, when, when we are starting off, um, for a country to tie itself up in the interest of protecting inv investment uh, to the extent that actually you stifle investment, you stifle the economic growth of yourself. Uh, National Treasury in South Africa, you, you may be aware, issued a document about a year or two ago to, to try and loosen itself up from the red tape it had created for itself. So, so maybe what can be done differently, maybe what can be done differently from how we did it. Try and ensure that you don't tie yourself up in the interest of protecting investment such that you are actually now stifled from progressing your own investment. That's one. <coughs> two. I think South Sudan should just continue to remain decisive. Um, you, you know, South Africa, uh, we, 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 we issued an integrated resource plan in 2010, uh, the IRP. If we had stuck with the IRP uh, the way it was drafted in 2010, we would be having additional 2,186 megawatts of power by 2021. But, but we, we have spent over 10 years debating, going back and forth, on the implementation of the integrated resource plan such that till today, we are now facing load shedding because we did not implement the plan we had for ourselves more than 10 years ago. So decisiveness uh, in the beginning when you are putting your country together becomes very important. Let, let me just touch on the issue of sanctions as well. From an SFF point of view, and I think from a South African point of view, for us, it's perplexing. Um, the, the, the sanctions imposed on, 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 on elements of South Sudan are aimed at ensuring that 
um, there is peace and continued investment. <coughs> and, and yet, it's stifling investment. So, so it, it, to us, it perplexes us. And, and we have taken the opposite approach. We have said, in fact, to ensure and maintain peace in South Sudan, we're going to invest. Because when the economy grows in South Sudan, we have something to protect. Uh, but when you impose sanctions um, and, and you stifle investment and you make investment difficult, uh, you are exacerbating conditions where peace does then not exist. So, so our position really is that, uh, that, that there needs to be that there can be areas of improvement, but I think there needs to be improvement from those who are also expected to support the peace process and the pro progression of the South Sudan new state. Um, and sanctions and the, and the removal of those sanctions is one major element that can play a critical role. I mean, so, so some of the conditions being imposed um, and, 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 the, and, the, and the request for uh, protection of investment that are being brought on African countries particularly are not the same as what you, you, you would find in Dubai and Singapore. But, but the, the, the request and, 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 the, and the manner in which African countries must tie themselves up to give assurance to investors that their investment is protected is only expected in African countries. Yet countries like Dubai and Singapore are very relaxed and very nimble. And yet we have certainty and assurance of investment in those countries. So I, I just think that um, there needs to be a perceptive change in those that are investing in South Sudan in as much as we can talk about the improvements that can happen from there. This is very good points. And uh, yes, keep it simple. Investors want simple processes, not processes that don't have protection, but things you can understand. I, I worked for a boss in my youth who wouldn't read anything unless you could fit it onto a single page. Yes. And you came and said, well, I've done my report on the changes that should be made. You know, it's 80 pages plus footnotes. I said, I'm not going to read it until it's on a single page. You put it on a single page and you sign and say, that's fine. It's an enormously good discipline. Keep things simple. My brother, what have you got to add to us on this, what could, you know South Sudan, you yeah. work there, yes. what could South Sudan, and this is not a criticism of South Sudan, no, no. it's c constructive, what could South Sudan do even better that would help investment to come there? So, okay, the, the issue of ease of doing business as segregated by the, the World Bank and others, I think we'll focus on certain parameters. But I think what matters most to me is not necessarily the speed at which you get your certificate or registration but whether there is a regulatory framework supported by a justice, a justice system that works. And I think South Sudan has got both. So I think the minister has uh, ably explained that, I mean, if you are doing some registration, obviously use a professional, a lawyer. If you are going to read uh, reports from uh, a, a seismic study, use a geologist, a geoscientist. If you are suffering from malaria, you go to a doctor. You don't safe, uh, pre uh, prescribe uh, medicines. So for me, I know the, the forms are many. But for us as a private sector company, that understands wherever we go, we are going to Kenya, we are going to Uganda and the region, DRC, we in DRC, we in Dubai. The first thing is to understand the laws of the country. And the second thing is to assess whether the justice system will protect you when you need to be protected. And those two elements are there. And uh, obviously, everything else will fall into place. So we don't have issues with the speed at which these documents will be coming at you. What we have issues is to observe, is the just system working? If it is working, we're good to go. So South Sudan, lots of papers. Lawyers will handle that for a fee. They, let them do it. Just system is there. We have issues with a partner, a business partner that needs to be settled. We go to court. We get a judgment which is fair, if we are not happy, we appeal, we go. That's what we want as a business. So I don't measure a country's progress by the, time, the speed at which they give you a, paper, a piece of paper. I measure when you, get, when you invest, what protection will they give you? Are they going to safeguard your interests? And are you able to, to do what you want to do in the framework of your investment uh, uh, project? That's it. So, Measures is nice for a degree, a PhD, to say these are the parameters, but what, more, what matters most? A good regulatory framework, supported by robust laws, and a just system that will make sure that those things work. Kalas, as they say in South Sudan, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's just so important, isn't it, this idea that the law is not going to change in three years' time, and the investment I put in, I was told I can take my capital out, 
And suddenly that changes once I put my capital in. The people want to know that in 10 years' time, the basic foundation, perhaps not the lattice work and the bricks, but the basic foundation of the way I invested in the country is not going to change. And when it does, of course, it scares investors away. We've had some wonderful, wonderful comments here, and you've been very patient and attentive. Is there anybody who's got a question here? This is the last session of the day, so I think I can risk going a little bit over time because hopefully I'm not running off anywhere else. But is there, and, and have we got somebody with a microphone? Are you able to get a microphone? Put a hand up again, please. I'm looking into the light, so I can't see very well, but I'm sure you can see it better there. <coughs> Single questions, please. Um, hello, my name is Elaine Mills from Argus Media. Uh, my first question is to the gentleman of the uh, Strategic Fuel Fund. Sorry, I didn't actually catch your name in the beginning. Um, I just want to know how the plans are going in terms of South Africa's investment in South Sudan. So there was going to be, a, say, um, let me just uh, <coughs> check, so aerograph gravity survey and seismic survey and drilling. There's also plans for a 60,000 barrel a day refinery. Um, and I read a report that that will commence soon. So I was just wondering how that is going. And then a question that a lot of people are asking is where's the money coming from? Because when it was announced at first, it, it's, a, it's a lot of money that South Africa is investing and uh, your parent company is um, struggling because Petro SA is virtually bankrupt. So could you perhaps just um, expand on where the financing is coming from? Thanks very much. Tough questions there. So, so do, do you want me to, to go ahead? Okay. Yeah, please. So, please. so the, 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 thank you very much for the question. Um, so firstly, let me indicate that the, the, the project is progressing well. Um, minister, I had a, a meeting with uh, Minister Gweda Mantashe earlier in the week. Um, and, and we briefed both ministers on the on the process on the progress of the project. Um, you, you are correct. So we are planning to start the gravity magnetic studies for uh, the block B2, um, and the plan is to do that within the the dry season, um, which is now between now and, uh, and and February March of of, of next year. So that is uh, on track. That, that work is underway. In fact, we have uh, just concluded the, the procurement process for that. Um, and um, we, we will then be getting on the ground and, and, start, and starting that, that particular aspect of the, the upstream work. Um, it, it, we, we actually even uh, hosted, uh, just about a month ago, the South Sudanese um, National Petroleum and Gas Commission here in South Africa. Um, and they were very happy with what, with what they saw. And, and, and we are um, actually in the process now of also um, engaging with them for, for, for the endorsement of, of, of this to, to proceed. Um, and, and, and before long, I mean, uh, with this, within this window, uh, which is the, the dry season, because you know, from March going forward, it starts to be raining and to exercise this, this project during, during that period becomes very expensive. So the, this window, we are on track in terms of uh, executing that work. Um, we have started and kicked off the pre-feasibility study on the refinery. We completed the procurement process on that, so that work is starting. Um, and we'll soon also be starting the feasibility study for the pipeline. Now, I, I, I need to address the issue of the financing. Um, first and foremost, um, we, we, we are doing a pre-feasibility study or feasibility studies for the refinery and the pipeline, which means that at this stage, there cannot be a firm number in terms of how much will be spent in that regard. So, so the, 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 the numbers that I've been seeing floating around in the papers, um, no one can give you a firm study that confirms that that is how much it's going to cost. The work that we are doing now is to firm up what is the actual cost that will come in the construction of a refinery and, and a pipeline. So once that study is done, uh, the Agas will be the first to know uh, in terms of what is the number that we can, we can give in terms of the cost that will come in that refinery. So, so that's the first. The, the, the second issue is um, the, the cost in terms of the, in terms of the, um, the, the upstream work. Now, the, the phase at which we are at now um, is an exploration phase. 
Um, so, so the exploration phase is what will tell us uh, once we've done the gravity magnetics and we've done the seismic studies, we'll then take that data and study that data and then decide in terms of what is the next steps that go forward. Um, and, and the cost in terms of the entire production, again, it's work that is in progress before we can firm up and say, actually, you know what, there is hydrocarbons here and this is what we are going to, if the hydrocarbons are commercial or not commercial and therefore this is what is going to cost going forward in order for us to continue producing. So the, the, there's been a lot of speculation. Um, I don't want to fall into that speculation. All I can say is that right now we are doing work that helps us formulate a position in terms of what is the cost going forward to the point of us being able to produce oil going forward. Excellent. Minister, are you still okay for time? If we take one or two more questions. Are you okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else in the room who's got a question on South Sudan? Um, Yes, so who's got the microphone? There we are. Thank you. Just your name and the question, please. Uh, my name is Ate, uh, Ate Taku. I'm uh, originally from Cameroon, but I'm just waiting for my South Sudanese passport. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in Juba for over 10 years, uh, cool. since uh, 2011, a couple of months after independence. And uh, I live in Cape Town as well. And I can tell you, in those 10 years, and for those who don't know, go on Google Earth, look at Juba 10 years ago, and Juba today. Look at any other city in the world, be it Dubai, be it New York, be it Paris, Cape Town, do exactly the same. You will see the transformation. Okay, so yes, there's been insecurity, there's been war, there's been issues, but let's stop, and I repeat, stop with capital S-T-O-P, focusing on the negatives. There's a lot of positives in South Sudan, in Juba, and the country as a whole. No country is perfect, and no country will ever be perfect. So please, and this is my statement, can we focus on the good things of South Sudan? There's a ton of them. They are tall. That's a positive, believe it or not. We don't talk about it. Basketball players from Africa, the best come from South Sudan. The best female models come from South Sudan. Those are positives. Thank Can we so focus much. on those sometimes? And Mr. Minister, as a part of the government, I do sometimes blame Mr. Minister and, her, and his colleagues because I don't think we as South Sudanese will do a good job selling our country and the positive parts of it. We need to do a lot more of that. We don't have to depend on foreigners to do it. Okay? We need to be proud of what we got and sing it high, as high as possible. Why is America so great? Because they tell you they are great. Right? Trump made it a big deal. Make America great again. Right? So we need to do the same. Sing our positives. And one of the biggest positives in South Sudan is agriculture. Why are we not singing our agriculture potential? I mean, uh, Mr. Tim mentioned ecotourism. We should be selling more of those. Okay, so please, I mean, this is my statement. Is let's, let's focus on some of the big positive South Sudan has. Yeah, we have some negatives, but let's not get stuck on that. We've got your point. Thank you okay. so much. Thanks. Um, I, I think you said add, that about all of Africa. Just one thing to add. Um, I know we talked about question. sanctions. I mean, Mr. Edward from, Robert from Trinity sitting next to you. Yes, sanction affects some of the big investors. But there's a lot of small businesses in South Sudan that are making good business with or without sanctions. We need to talk about those as well. So please, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody got a question? More than the state. Anybody actually got a question? Why we've got, we, we've got this gifted panel here, and I don't say that lightly. We've got people who collectively have probably 100 or more years collective experience in South Sudan, uh, really at the face of business. So is there anybody who's got a question? Don't say afterwards, oh, I didn't get a chance. Um, anybody who'd like to ask a question? Please, thank you, sir. I think mine's not going to be a question again. Um, I'm towing the line of uh, Ate. Uh, as South Sudanese, we grew in Juba in the 70s. Why I'm saying it so? In the 70s, it was very hard even to see like, good buildings in Juba, or in Malakal, or Wau. 
despite that we were in the old Sudan, and Juba is the second, okay, the second largest city to Khartoum, but a big, big difference. You go to Medeni, you go to Kosti, all those towns are Rua, bigger than Juba in terms of development. In Juba in the 70s, you find the ministers, they were having only like less than 100 cars. Imagine, South Sudan, the regional autonomy in the 70s, they have less than 100 cars. And the road infrastructure, there was only one tarmac road that runs from Melikia up to Juba town. Maybe less than two kilometers. That was the tarmac road by then. That's where they struggled with, with Sudan. Finally, we got independence. When you got independence, as somebody said before, the difference that you can see now in Juba the development in Juba. In less than 10 years, despite that, we, we have been like wrangling among ourselves, okay, but still you can see the difference. You can see good buildings, you know, uh, good cars. You, you find even population of cars become almost maybe half of the population of Juba. Juba today, or South Sudan government, okay, despite our wranglings, the oil we are talking about, we inherited 75% of the oil from Sudan. 75% when you got independence. We are pumping 350,000 barrels per day. But today we are pumping, the production is less than 200,000 per day. Now, we want to improve. We want to improve the production. We want to appeal to the investors to come to South Sudan. Look at the technology. What equipments are these old companies are using? Sometimes, I went to the oil fields many times. The drilling equipments are almost like outdated ones, completely outdated. We have geoscientists scientists here, I believe. In South Sudan, the drilling operations, they use blind drilling, not using MWD tools, which is called downhole tools, okay? To tell you exactly where you are when you are drilling. The cementing sometimes they used, okay, maybe the chemicals. One time, you find the conductor sink almost like a meter, causing that displacement. Imagine one meter displaces, it, it also displaces where in the reservoir itself. So what we need from you investors, we need the latest technology to, you know, latest technology. MW tools, we need Slombaje and others to come to South Sudan to help us to unlock our reserves. You should have been on the panel. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You very much. Thank you. Does anybody have a question? A question, question, question. Just it's the last one. It's the last question of the last session on the last day. And it's not what will be Saturday's lotto numbers. If you know, please let us know, by the way. Has anybody actually got a question here about the statements are very good and backed up everything that was said on stage, and we really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. We've had great audiences here. I've been blessed Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Somebody's got it. You've got another question here, ma'am. Do you want to f close off with a question? Sorry, I know I've from August Media. asked one. Yes, from August Media. Um, my questions relate to refinery plans. Um, so I want, would like to ask the minister. Um, the Bentu refinery started earlier this year, and you, uh, uh, you, is that still on track to ramp up to 10,000 barrels a day by the end of the year? And you also mentioned plans for four more refineries. I was just wondering what the capacity would be of those and where. And then could I also ask a question to Trinity Energy, also refinery-related? Um, 
You won't get another chance. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, as I understand it, you have plans for a refinery, 40,000 barrels a day, and you wanted to start construction next year. And I think it was going to become an operation by 2024. So I was just wondering if that is also still on track. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, do you want to start with that, with well, your refineries? Uh, <coughs> well, thank you once again. Uh, like you put it, it's the last question, the last session, the last day. Uh, I'm glad to be part of the last. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Now, as to the refinery, uh, Jacob did mention earlier that seven arts have constructed a, a refinery where Nalpet have 30% and their company, the Russian company, has 70%. And for your information, the refinery has been running. We only experience the challenge of evacuation route. Where do you take the product? There is a market but there is no route for you to reach to the market. Basically, roads. And he did talk about uh, Na River dredging so that we could use the river transport to bring the product to Juba. And when it reaches Juba, it can go to other estates. Sorry, ladies. We, we... It can go to other estates like Eastern Equatoria, Western Equatoria. Some of it will go to Malekal, it will go to Bor, and in the part of other parts of the country, like in Bargazel, if you have the route to take it to a place called Wau, then you will also be able to distribute it to other parts of the country. So our problem has been the evacuation route. Now, as to whether we have a plan to build other refineries, yes, we do. But as to what capacity should the refinery be will depend on two things. One, where do we place it? Two will be where we are placing it. How much are we producing in that location? Do we have the capacity to produce more in that particular block or not? If we have the capacity to do so, then we will also be able to increase the number of barrels that we wanted to do. Now, what, will, what is the plan? We encourage investors to come up with the modular refineries because they are able, you can be able to adjust those refineries depending on your production. So that is the plan. Now, if you look at the market around us, I did mention on the first day that South Sudan is the fifth in Africa in terms of proven oil reserve, and we are the only East African producing country at the moment. What does that mean? It means, if you look at the neighboring states, if you take Ethiopia, for example, today, they use 79,000 barrels per day. Now, if tomorrow the dam work and they have too much electricity, of course, they will not use it on car. They will only use it in their houses and light up. But you will still remain with more than 40-something percent of that amount, meaning out of 79, you may at least use 30-something thousand barrels a day. That is a market that is ready. Go to Sudan. Sudan today, as part of the arrangement of independence, we have something called TFA. That is to support Sudan. And that agreement was signed in 2012. I believe by the beginning of next year, that agreement will come to an end. How? Today we pay them 28,000 barrels per day. And they use those barrels in their refineries as a part of payment. Now, if that comes to an end next year, where will they get fuel from? They will entirely depend on the Republic of South Sudan because the refineries will not be able to work. The capacity of the refineries, they will not be able to fill it up. They will not have enough production for them to be able to run to run those refineries. Therefore, Sudan itself is a market. Now, where is the other market? Central Africa Republic is also a market. They all depend on Mombasa. You get fuel, you come all the way, you do your Panya Road, you read there. If we manage to have the refineries, we will be able to supply Central Africa Republic. 
go to DRC. Today, some people and Trinity Energy, I think they are in DRC, they are supplying fuel there. In the state for them to supply fuel, we wanted to produce fuel. Nalped will take it. Trinity will take it. Southern uh, Company, one of the gentlemen who is sitting there will take it. And any other company, they will go to the refinery, buy it at a cheaper price, go to Congo. You supply fuel. The same to Kenya. Kenya today, they have the product five line, but they will not produce more than we do. Uganda the same, they will not produce more than we do. And if they cannot produce more than we do, then we still have the market in both Kenya and Uganda. This is only neighboring countries. We have not yet gone far. If we decide to go far, we will need a lot. But leave alone that. Even our internal market, internally, we need fuel. And if we need fuel, we will be better off exporting the product. So our objective is not only to export crude. What we have today, if we decided to only refine it home and export product, we will still you know, accommodate the number that you did mention earlier. Now, I did agree with uh, my brother when he said you do blame us. Yes, I think it's important that we reach out, we go out, we take the heat, you know. But at the end of the day, if the result can serve the Republic of South Sudan and our population better, be it, 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 it really helps. Now, my last word on the last day, last question, <laughs> is we are willing to learn from other people. There are mistakes that we may be committing today. Others have committed them 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago. We are ready to sit down, like I said earlier, with anybody with the skills and the experience to listen to them. Listen to their experience. And based on that, as long as it's a positive one, we will be able to change based on that. We are not resistant to that. And I'm glad that my brother from Trinity did mention earlier. You know, a day before yesterday, when the function started, when we went for a break, somebody aggressed me. But that particular person, I came to learn that yesterday, because in his mind, they are told South Sudanese are very aggressive. So he wants to study it here at the highest level. I just get, so that I get angry and we start a fight from there. But what I did, because I wanted to understand the person, I told him, look, why don't we have, a tea, why don't we have tea, tea together? I want to share something with you. He said, okay, today I'm busy. I told him, even me, I'm busy. We agreed to meet yesterday. Yesterday he came to Radisson. We had a meeting. And we argue, we argue, at the end of the day, he disclosed to me that I was doing that intentionally. That is not who we are. That is not who we are. But one problem that we have, and some of you will go to South Sudan, will find that. In every community, there are good ones, there are bad ones. But I can say today, I think majority of our people, they are good ones, but they don't want somebody to lie to them. When you lie to a South Sudanese, they will remind you about it tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. But to some people, when you lie to somebody, you just want to pass time. time. But that's not who we are. So we are not as bad as other people think about us. And when it comes to corruption, somebody told me, if you go to a minister office in South Sudan, for them to sign your paper, they will request you for a payment. That is a great lie. I can swear before God, from the time I assume office up to today, I never request anybody. But this is the office where a lot of investors are passing through in terms of business. But I don't go to them and ask them. So if I cannot, and I hold more contracts in that office, more than any other office, then it means it's a lie. If somebody meets somewhere, 
with someone who have committed their own mistake, it does not mean South Sudanese have committed that mistake. I would conclude by saying, the Republic of South Sudan is the destination to go. And if you miss out today, I'm a cell man huh, today, if you miss out today, 30 years down the line, don't blame. Some of us will not be there in terms, maybe in terms of politics, if we are alive, but you will find pretty much other people who know what it takes, and there will be so much competition, and you will find it rough for you to come to the Republic of South Sudan because of the competition. But if you go today, no much competition, everything is available, you will have the opportunity to study it, and others will learn from you, like Trinity have done it, and other people today are referring to Trinity as one of a private company, private owned company, that is excelling. This is to say, once uh, somebody came to my office with a contract, and this just to let you know that some of the investors also that come, and they go out there and tell wrong stories about South Sudan, they themselves are wrong. Somebody came to my office with a 50-page document. He drafted his own contract, and he came to me and said, I want to do this. Could you please sign this? Just in the morning. I look at him and say, is a contract? Yes. Is your company registered? Yes. I say, okay, give it to me. Let me refer it to my technical team. I refer the document to two people. One of the people is sitting here, called Mohamelino, a technical per person. I told him, look at the technicality of this contract. I refer the document again to the legal team to say, look at the legality of, the, of what somebody is saying. You know in that document what it say? The person say, he wanted South Sudan to place him between us and any investor that is coming in the country for our blocks. Okay? That's what he wanted. When the legal advisor w went through, he said, this is not right. If an investor is coming to deal with the government, why would you have a middleman in the middle? The technical advisor came back and said, this document technically is not acceptable because of A, B, C, D, E. I called the person after two days and said, technically, you, you miss A, B, C, D, E. Go and correct it. Legally, we cannot place you between us and any investor that is coming in the country. The same person went out and said, oh, these South Sudanese, they don't want investors. We don't want brokers, but we want investors. So what I'm saying, we welcome investors, but we don't welcome brokers. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Nice comment, and I think the last word goes to Robert Trinity. Eh? You, 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 you were asked a question? Oh, yeah, I was, I think. About your yeah. building. Of course, uh, uh, a, refinery, a, re a refinery is not something like building a house. So we've, we sent off the barrels to the designers, and they have looked at it, they have configured, and we're going through phases because there are financials that we have to convince to come along because you're talking of something between 450 to 500 million just to, to do this. So we are progressing. The targets that we shared probably will move here and there, but we, we, are, we, are, we are looking at it <coughs> and going forward. But just on a light note, the minister said something about signing documents. So I came in uh, three, four days ago at the airport here, and I was changing $100 into Southern, uh, uh, the, the rand. And the lady took my passport, took the hundred dollars, looked at it through machine, and said, okay. She gave me a form, sign here. I looked at it, I signed. Then she printed another form, sign here. I'm an accountant by training, a tax consultant by practice, a lecturer, a former lecturer of chartered accountants. I have a way of reading in the middle and reading the whole page. And there, in there, it was saying that I should sign so that they can share all my personal information I, 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 with everybody who is interested. And that I give all my rights. I said, who do you think I am? I'm an African. I don't give my rights easily like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so lesson, I think, I know ease of doing business and all sorts of things. Lesson is, let us control what we give. So the laws of any country are very important. 
the judicial, as I'm repeating myself, judiciary system is very important. Never, ever sign anything that is coming from a briefcase of an investor. Absolutely. Kalas. I know, I know. <laughs> I just cannot agree more with this. Uh, South African companies have this habit of giving you a page with a whole lot of small print on the back, in which it says, it, whole, many of those things are actually against the law. Um, and yeah, just read it and don't sign it. Uh, just two last comments, if I can give the last comment uh, on the last day. One is that I've worked on all six continents of the world, and there's something that I've taken away that's the same across everywhere. If you want an answer in a hurry, it's invariably no. If you want to get something right, build long, slow, and deep relationships, and when you need a signature, it will be there. Don't rush in and say, I'm the new guy, I want this sign. And the other one is, I'll give you, because I'm an old man and I won't need it for too much longer, I'll give you the tip of how to get past Robert's problem. I will come in through a building and there'll be somebody at the front with a clipboard saying I'm assigned away all my rights that if I'm injured or anything falls on me, they're not responsible. You know what you do? You take out your pen and you sign your name as D-E-C-L-I-N-E-D, -E -E but in running writing, decline. I say, oh, thank you for your signature. And they open the boom and through you go. Never, never sign away your rights. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been a wonderful, wonderful, attentive audience. We've had questions out of here, but very good media questions uh, from August. Uh, would you give yourselves a big hand, please? Because you are what makes this happen. You are what makes it. And can I ask you, and this is the only time I have asked this, but because of the panel we've had, I'm going to ask you to stand up and applaud our panel. This has been an exceptional We'll also stand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you. And see you. Thank you.